I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to my workshop, Feast Your Eyes Upon the Greatest Sawhorses Ever Created. I also have some super long torsion boxes that when combined make for a pretty good on-site workbench or a knockdown workstation for here in the shop. If and you're interested in how I build these and some of the awesome features, well, you're in luck. Stick around and let this video unfurl before you. The starting point for this project was I wanted a gluing station for here in the shop that I could knock down and store on a shelf when not in use. In other words, when I'm working on a project, I don't want the things that I'm clamping together to clutter my workbench and get in my way. So I put on my thinking cap and remembered back many years to the days when I was first starting out in construction. I remember that I worked with a carpenter that had two of these torsion beams and he'd use them as kind of a makeshift on-site workbench. So from there, I took the idea and ran with it and added a bunch of features of my own. And the end result is a nice strong workstation that is super easy to set up and packs away nice and small. One set of beams is eight feet long, the other is five feet long. So when they're connected together, that makes them uh, carry the two, three, three, I think 13 feet, but check my math on that. I also added some dog holes for clamping and I made this cutting station and this is great for when I have to dado or cross cut really long pieces that are too heavy or big to get onto my sliding table saw. A perfect example would be a giant countertop. I used a jig known as the PARF guide to drill these rows of 20 millimeter dog holes and the PARF guide system helps you drill rows of dog holes at 90 degrees to each other which makes it perfect for making cutting stations. A benefit of using it to drill both the holes in the beams and the cutting station is all the holes line up so you can just drop dogs in and it kind of locks everything together. So the end result is a nice setup for cross cutting large work pieces and all manner of different fences and jigs can be set up and used with this pattern of holes. I also added a pipe clamp vise, and this thing is surprisingly stable. It's good enough to hand plane on. And if the floor happens to be out of level, a couple of shims can ensure that the beams are coplanar. A nice flat reference surface helps ensure that glue ups are nice and flat. And here's the main event for me. I sized everything to fit these 24 inch clamps conveniently. This takes care of 90% of my cabinet doors, drawer boxes, panel glue ups, etc. And with a little bit of effort, I can of course glue up larger stuff. Here's a look at the job site version. If I'm hanging some moldings or installing doors or something, I can bring this to me with the job site and have a nice sturdy workbench. For a little extra credit, I made some low saw horses. These are great for when I'm working on case pieces that I would otherwise be working on them when they're on the ground. The two beams can also be bumped together for 15 inch wide work surface if you don't feel like putting a sheet of plywood over top. Two key features to these saw horses, the top can be removed and replaced with five screws and I can clamp on all four sides. After that informative and stimulating sales pitch as to why these torsion beams are great, let's go ahead and make a set. Step one is to make a bunch of rip cuts. The wider pieces are cut to seven and a half, the narrower pieces are cut to four inches. And these dimensions allow you to get a pair of beams out of one four by eight sheet of plywood. After the pieces are all cut to width, I clamp them all together in order and I mark the locations where I wanna cut biscuit slots. And if you prefer to not use the mighty biscuit, then come up with some other method for alignment. As these pieces all come together, things can get wonky pretty quick during glue up and having something to register the parts to each other is very helpful. After the biscuit slot party, I do a quick test fit. And if you're wondering what material I'm using, I'm using good old fashioned 2332 CAT PS 1-09 square structural plywood Douglas fir comma application as 4x8 from Lowe's for $39.98 a sheet. Wacky convoluted titles like that are the reason the lumber industry is so confusing and no one knows what they're talking about, myself included. Once I'm happy with all the joinery holding the boxes together, I mark and drill two 1 and 1 16th inch holes for the pipe clamp vise. Nextly, I break out the PARF guide system that I spoke of earlier and I drill a row of 20 millimeter dog holes. 
And if you'd like more information about this jig, you can jump on Google and do a search and you'll get hundreds of videos. Better yet, if you visit my channel, I have a video called A Modern Cabinet Maker's Workbench where I use this very same guide to drill a bunch of holes and I talk more about how it works. The penultimate task before glue up is to cut some biscuit slots that register the internal blocking that helps keep the beams square. The ultimate task is to cut the corresponding slots in the blocking. Here's a look at how everything comes together before the chaos of glue up begins. And here's one of the unsung benefits of using biscuits for glue-ups like this. The rounded shape of the biscuit allows parts to be rolled together that have joinery in opposing or adjacent faces. I think the shot really demonstrates how some form of alignment during glue-up is extremely helpful. And I use a handful of brad nails on each seam to hold everything together while the glue dries. I really like this feature of adding these sleeves. It allows two beams to really act as one once they're clamped together. This little setup, as simple as it is, works really well. At this point the beams are all glued together and I thought it would be a good time to make the cutouts in the bottoms. I started with the jigsaw and while this worked okay and I was happy with the results, the beams were light enough, they were easy to pick up, I was not happy with the cut quality left by the jigsaw. After standing around staring at these things wondering how I could cut these openings faster with better results, Lightning struck my brain and I had what I think would be described as an idea. I decided to break out my track saw and cut the openings with it. This ended up being faster and gave much better results. Of course the track saw with its rounded blade can't cut all the way into the corners. No problem, I come back with my Ryoba and finish off the cut. I add a 1 8 inch radius round over to all exposed edges and I come back with a tool known as a saw rasp to round over the back side of the handles to ensure that a splinter can't exact its revenge upon my hands. I give everything a quick sanding with 120 grit sandpaper and finally I add two coats of polyurethane with a roller. And I'm sure this is not the recommended method of application, but for shop fixtures it's fine. Now it's time to shift gears and build some sawhorses. I'm using 2x4s and 2x6s for the construction of these sawhorses. I had to spend the better part of an hour digging through every rack in the store to find some serviceable material. I straighten one face and one edge at the joiner, then I head over the planer to bring the material down to final thickness, which in this case is inch and a quarter. I use my trusty chop saw and a stop block to ensure all parts are cut to equal length. The final phase is to rip parts to width at the table saw. The 2x6s get cut down to 5 inches, and the 2x4s get cut down to 3 inches.
With the parts cut to size, it's time for some joinery. I summon my dado stack from the dusty drawer it resides in to help me with the first task, and that is a half lap between the foot and the leg. After I'm done with the layout and singing like one of the chipmunks, I turn the table saw on and get to cutting. The first two cuts, I use a stop block. This helps me define the outside edges of the half lap joint. The second series of cuts is just removing the waste in between. For the mating cut, I was able to remove the bulk of the waste at the bandsaw, and I do this just to reduce the mess created by the dado stack at the table saw. Cuts finished at the table saw using the same saw blade height as I did in the previous cut, which was half the thickness of my workpiece. I left the legs a little wide intentionally so that I can come back and do a few skim cuts and sneak up on a nice snug fit. With the lap joints between the foot and leg, toit like a toiger, it's time to work in the joinery for the stretchers. I'm not sure if this is a lap joint, a bridle joint, or an open-ended mortise and tenon joint. Either way, I cut it at the bandsaw. I use the same edge to reference both cuts. On the second cut, I'm adding a spacer to establish the width of the joint, which in this case is one inch. I definitely could have cut closer to my line with the coping saw, but there's something very satisfying about cutting left to right with a band saw. And I have a framing square set up as my depth stop. The joinery for the top stretcher is complete. Now I work on the mortises for the lower stretchers and I begin by making a router template. CA glue and some accelerator make fast work of assembling jigs like this. And this jig is set up to reference the bottom edge and the same reference edge that I used for the last joinery task for each workpiece. I'm using a big ol' honkin' four inch long half inch diameter router bit along with a guide bushing and this jig I get a one inch wide by two and a half inch long mortise. It's never a good idea to use an old, dull router bit. The end result is burnt end grain. And by the way, burnt end grain is going to be the name of the barbecue restaurant that I open up. Now it's time to cut some tenons. I start with the upper stretchers and I establish the shoulders on three sides. And for the lower stretchers, I establish the shoulder on all four sides using the same saw settings. And I cut the cheeks of both the upper and lower stretchers at the bandsaw. I think this is a great way to cut tenons if you can get your bandsaw set up accurately enough. If not, the table saw on a dado stack is a great way to do this same operation. make a blade height adjustment at the table saw, I recut the edges of the tenons to the proper depth, then I cut the nubbins off at the bandsaw. It's a half an inch for the upper stretcher, and it's a quarter of an inch on each side for the lower stretchers. Here's one of my very favorite pro tips. Overcut the shoulders of a tenon just a tiny bit, a 30 second is plenty. This creates a channel for glue to fall into as the two parts are coming together and greatly reduces the chances of squeeze out. 
Since I cut the lower mortises with a router, the four corners are radiused, I decided to round over the tenons versus square up the mortise. I think it was at this point in the project I made a mistake. I normally like to square up the mortises. I think it gives a more hand-cut appearance. But I was in a hurry to get this project done, so I decided to round over the tenons just to save some time. And in the end, I think the joint looks more machine-cut. I don't think it's quite as refined. I decided to cut a couple of angles on the feet in an attempt to give the sawhorse a better stance. Getting close to being done, it's now time to glue the legs to the feet. And when you look at this joint, you'll notice there's a lot of glue surface area. This makes for a strong joint. In fact, this is probably one of the strongest ways you can glue two pieces of wood together. I bring this up because it's a fairly easy joint to machine. A table saw or router will do it real easy. So next time you're working on a project where you need some strength in the joinery, consider doing a lap joint. And once again, back to the bandsaw to establish the feet. If you've never heard of the furniture maker James Krenov, I suggest you, of course, watch this video all the way to the very end. Give it a thumbs up, like, share, subscribe, phone a friend, tell your mom, follow you, follow me, all that social media gobbledygook. When you're done with all that, look up James Krenov. I mention him because much can be learned from his work, and I think everyone should know about him. I also mention him because I essentially stole his design for these sawhorses. I did make one change, and that is I made a removable horizontal top versus the vertical style that he had. And I think for me, this is going to help with the functionality of these sawhorses. Speaking of removable top, uh, after a couple coats of polyurethane, I screw the top down. And since I was waxing my legs already, I decided I would throw a coat of wax on the sawhorses and the beams to prevent glue and finish and stuff from sticking to them. So when it's all said and done, I think this is going to make a pretty useful station for both here in the shop and out on the job site. And after living with these for a couple of days in the shop, I'm already considering some improvements to include locating pins between the torsion beams and the sawhorses. You'll be seeing more of these in future videos, and I'll try and point out any changes that I've made. Also, if you'd like to build yourself any or all of what you saw in this video, I'll have plans available for sale on my website. So until next time, thanks for watching.